Yeah, so hi everyone, my name is Chris Dravandi. I'm a senior lecturer in statistics at QUT. Uh, so this is some joint work with a guy called Stuart Trost who's in the School, uh, school of Exercise Sciences. So, so this work is sort of in the area of exercise science rather than sports science, but I think there's some definite connections being between the two and uh, the types of statistical analyses that we might do in the two areas is probably quite similar. So this talk is going to be mostly a tutorial, actually. Actually, So I'm going to start off with the motivation for hierarchical models. OK, so we have some kind of regression framework where we have a response variable, that's the target variable, and we also have some potential predictors that might explain the variation in that response. So we're in a, we're in a, like a very typical regression type of framework. And But we have this challenge that we may have several individuals in our data set and we may also collect multiple observations on all of those individuals. So we're going to get some additional variability because all individuals are different. So data I collect from you is going to be da different to data that I collect from me. And furthermore, there's going to be correlation in the observations for, for that individual and correlations in the observations for me, for example. So it's important that when we're forming our statistical models is about how do we account for these features in the data set when we're doing our models. Okay, so what's kind of like a naive approach to handle this kind of situation? So the easiest thing would be to say, well, I'll give each individual their own parameter. Okay, so I'll give you your own parameter, I'll give you another parameter, I'll give myself another parameter, and use that parameter to explain the difference in, in the variation in the data between individuals. But if we also think about a data set where we have lots of individuals, and furthermore, we may not have many observations on each of those individuals. So in that case, we're going to have a very large number of parameters, which might lead to overfitting of the model. Okay, so this is bad because we might end up explaining the noise in the data set rather than the signal. Okay, so it can lead to, it can lead to problems like overfitting, um, poor statistical inferences, and also your model's not going to have a very good predictive power. Okay, so we want to try to account for these features of the data, but, but we also don't, we don't want to overfit the model. Okay, so one potential solution is to still allow each different individual to have their own parameter, but then make the assumption that all of our parameter values come from a population distribution. So, so we all get to have our own set of parameters, but there's some kind of restriction to those parameters. So from that point of view, we actually effectively reduce the number of parameters that we have in the model. So we've got this effect of uh, you know, reducing the effective number of parameters. And furthermore, it also allows us to borrow strength in our data. So if I don't have many observations on a particular person, but I have some other person who might be similar, then that person can actually borrow strength from, from the data of that similar type of person. So we get that kind of benefit as well. So we get these advantages and we also um, are able to do what we wanted to do. So we want to account for the between subject variability in the data and we also want to account for potential correl correlated data within a particular individual. Okay, so we have, we have a model which has a certain number of parameters and we have our data set. Now we want to calibrate the model to the data. So essentially what we want to do is we want to estimate the parameters of the model. Right, so there's a couple of different frameworks for doing that. So one of them is called the classical framework and that's based on something called the likelihood function. Okay, so the likelihood function is just the probability that you observe the data set that you observed conditional on the parameter of your model. So we can think about that as a function of the parameter, and we're trying to find the parameter value that maximizes that function. Right, so we want to find the parameter value that maximizes the probability of getting the data. Okay, so that's a pretty standard approach for estimating parameters, but in the context of hierarchical models or random effects models or mixed, mixed effects models, by the way, they're all the same thing. So when people talk about in the literature, oh, we fit a mixed effects model, we fit a random effects model, we fit, we fit a hierarchical model, they're all actually the same thing. So in the context of mixed models, there's not actually an analytical expression for the likelihood function. So essentially what you have to do is you're, you're approximating your model in the same way. So effectively what you're doing 
is you're estimating the parameters of a slightly different model. Okay, so that's one of the drawbacks. And secondly, when we estimate our parameters, we get a point estimate of the parameter, but we also want to know about the uncertainty in the parameter as well. So we want some kind of interval for that parameter. So in the classical framework, these intervals are based on asymptotic arguments. So you've probably heard about things like, oh, you take your point estimate and go plus, plus or minus two times the standard error. Okay, so that's typically what you do in a classical framework. And so that, that kind of uncertainty quantification is not appropriate in all situations. So, and that's especially the case when you've only got a small number of observations. Okay, so there's certainly nothing, nothing wrong with the classical approach, but it does have these, some of these limitations. And another approach called the, the Bayesian approach does help us to kind of overcome some of these limitations. Okay, so some of the advantages of the Bayesian approach is that we don't need to do any approximations to our mixed effect model now. That's one thing. And the other good thing about the Bayesian approach is it gives you, there's no asymptotic arguments in there. So all of your inferences are only conditional on the data that you saw, right? So you get a proper quantification of the uncertainty in your parameters. And also, in, in the classic framework, when we, hit, when, we fit the, when we fit these random effects models, we typically go, only get estimates about the population parameters. But for whatever reason, we may also be interested in learning about particular individuals in your data set. Okay, so the Bayesian framework also gives you inferences not only about the population parameters, but also about all of the random effects you have in your model as well. And the final advantage is that with the Bayesian analysis, we can potentially incorporate prior information into the analysis. Okay, so in the Bayesian approach, what we do is we treat our parameters as random variables. And we have these two different objects. We've got the prior distribution, which is a probability distribution over your parameter space. And the idea of the prior is to incorporate uh, any information that you have about those parameters before you collect the data, right? So if you've done some kind of similar studies, you can incorporate that information into the prior. And furthermore, if you've got some expert opinion, then we can also incorporate that into the prior as well. Okay, so we have the information about the parameter before we collect the data. And then we combine that information uh, about what we learn about the parameters through the data. And that comes through the, the specification of the statistical model. So we combine these two pieces of information together and that gives us something called the posterior distribution. Now all the inferences that we make then can be based on this posterior distribution. So what we do is we take samples from this posterior and for example if you wanted to get a point estimate of your parameter what you might do is you might take the average of all of those samples so that's going to give you something called a posterior mean and that might be your point estimate of the parameter and then you can do things like oh let's take the 2.5 percent quantile and the 95 percent 97.5% quantile of those samples, and that's going to give you a 95% uh, interval for your parameter as well. Okay, so in one slide, all of you guys are now experts on Bayesian statistics, so that's good stuff. Okay, so we applied, uh, we applied these Bayesian hierarchical models to this um, accelerometer data. So the purpose of this analysis was to um, assess the, the efficacy of these so-called cut points for classifying activities. So these cut points are based on the output of the accelerometer. Okay, so what they did in this particular study was have a whole bunch of participants in a particular, um, in a particular age range and they got them to do different activities. Okay, so what the response variable is, is whether or not the, the, a particular cut point um, predicted the actual activity correctly. Okay, so the response variable that we have is a zero or one binary variable. And then we have potential predictors that might explain, explain that binary variable. So we've got the, the different activity might be important. Uh, the age might be important and also the particular cut point. So there's four cut points. So the particular cut point that was applied might also be important. Okay, so if you have a situation where you've got a binary response, what kind of regression analysis might you do on that data? First question for the day. 
It starts with L. Yeah. Yeah, logistic regression, that's right. So if, if you have a, a, a sort of like a, a binary response, then you might think about doing some kind of logistic regression. Okay, so that's what we did here. So we've got the logistic regression model with the classification as the, as the response variable and our predictors as well. Now you can see here that we actually have multiple observations on all of those individuals. So we want to account for that kind of thing as well. So we accounted for that by including a random intercept in the model. Okay, so that creates the, the random effects model. Okay, so these are the results that we got from the, uh, from the analyses. So you can see we've got the four different cut points there. And we have the predictive probability that each cut point classified a random activity at each particular age. Okay, so they're the, they're the points there. But the good thing about the Bayesian analysis is that you get this quantification of the uncertainty. So you've got these point estimates here, but then you've also got your 95% credible intervals around that as well. So you get a really nice and correct quantification of the uncertainty. So you can see that, you know, at the ends of the age range, the, the variability is larger there, and that's because you don't have a, as much data out in the tails here. Okay, so the, the analysis does reflect that. Okay, so we can see that cut point four is really crap because the correct classification probability is very small, but it does seem to improve for some reason as you increase the age. But I mean, we don't really give a crap about the results. It's all about, you know, we, we get this proper quantification of the uncertainty. Um, and that's all I had to say, so thanks very much. Was this a single accelerometer, like a risk wearable? Um, it might have been. I actually have no idea. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm, just, I'm just thinking the application is to, like, specifically from the states, that would be to wearables to predict your activity and then log it for you. And, uh, yeah, that's right. So I think the main motivation is to assess how good these cut points are. And, you know, if they're not particularly good, it might motivate people to develop different classification methods, so better classification methods that sort of outperform these, these approaches here. Okay, so no other questions, so thanks very much guys.